She was a matriarch and a first lady. This time on Poll Hub, Barbara Bush was the wife of one president, mother of another. But as USA Today Washington Bureau Chief Susan Page explains in her exhaustive new biography, she has a place in history in her own right. Famously prickly with at least some reporters, Mrs. Bush agreed to multiple interviews with Page and to the author's surprise, then gave her full access to all of her diaries. Great stories ahead about an iconic American woman, this time on Polo. And hi, everybody. Welcome to Poll Hub. I'm J.D. Dapper, Director of Innovation here at the Marist Poll. And I'm Barbara Carvalho, Director of the Marist Poll. Yeah, I'm Lee Marigoff, Director of the Marist College Institute for Public Opinion. It's our pleasure today to welcome to the Poll Hub podcast Susan Page. She is Washington Bureau Chief for USA Today, a political analyst you can see almost everywhere, uh, including MSNBC. She has covered six White House administrations, 10 campaigns. She is all things politics, which she writes about. And she is also, the reason for today's chat, the author of The Matriarch, Barbara Bush and the Making of an American Dynasty. Susan, so great to have you today. It's such a pleasure to be with you. So let me let me start with this. Um, most or many biographers often start at the beginning of someone's life, the kind of the born on the mountaintop approach, which which Barbara Bush actually had, and you know, an ancestor who was a pilgrim. Um, or they, you know, they they start with uh, the pinnacle of the person's public uh, career, which often we all know about. But you chose to begin the story of Barbara Bush uh, with the illness and the death of her three-year-old daughter, Robin. Why is that the beginning? You know, that's such a, su- such a smart question because that was not how I had planned it. When I was proposing the book to publishers, I said the first uh, chapter would be about the 1988 election, the election that put George H.W. Bush in the White House. And when I wrote the first draft of The Matriarch, that's what I did. Uh, and I realized in finishing that first draft that it was, that it felt wrong, that the 1988 election was the pinnacle, was the defining experience for George Bush. It made him president. It was not the defining experience for Barbara Bush. And what I realized after spending a year talking to Barbara Bush, reading her diaries, interviewing other family members, it was the realization that she was fundamentally changed by the illness and death of Robin in 1953. And it was a thread that uh, persisted through the rest of her life. Did you find what you expected when you started this project? I started it thinking Barbara Bush had been uh, underestimated, that she was funnier and sharper and meaner than most Americans do. <laughs> they thought of her as this great, wonderful, warm grandmother, and she was a loving grandmother, but she was also kind of a pistol. Um, I thought she had had more influence with her husband and son than she was generally credited with giving. Uh, but So that wasn't a surprise to me, but the, but the extent of her influence, the nature of her influence, was a surprise to me in everything from campaign strategy that her husband followed to her son's initiative on AIDS in Africa, PEPFAR, one of his sig- a signature part of his legacy. That was surprising. And also the fact that that she, can, she that over and over again on big issues, she would return to her experience with Robin as a touchstone on everything from her views on abortion to her determination to address the stigma that was faced in the 1980s uh, by people who had AIDS. Uh, So those were things. And one other thing was surprising to me was how much I grew to like her. Uh, You know, she, she um, she was tough. She had been kind of tough on me on occasion when I was covering her husband's administration. But I spent, I did five long interviews with her in the last six months of her life, and I really grew to like her. No, that You know, it's so funny, because in your comments to, to that question, uh, you touched on about six or seven things I wanted to ask you, so let me see if I can sort through them. So let me start with, when you first met her way back when, what was your first impression of her? Because uh, we get a sense now of, you know, from the book, you're kind of writing all about the, the impressions you developed. When you first met her, when, you know, you've seen so many people and so many first ladies. What was that all about when you first first spotted her, first chatted with her way back when? Well, she was 
super down to earth, right? Um, and she was pretty blunt. And I remember uh, uh, two things. One, I tried to do a profile of her. In fact, I wrote a profile of her for Newsday, uh, the paper on Long Island that I was working for at the time. Mm -hmm. And she refused to talk to me for it <laughs> because <laughs> she had talked to me. I'd interviewed her on other occasions about her, about her husband. She refused to do an interview with me where um, I talked. To, she would be forced to talk about herself. So I ended up following her around. I took two trips where she was going to be out of town, one in New Hampshire and one in Texas, where I would then go with the local press corps and I would just ask questions at the news conferences she was having, much to her annoyance. <laughs> 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 when she would see me out there doing what amounted to an interview for a profile, but doing it episodically. Uh, kind of uh, high, moonlighting as a member of the local press corps. There was another time in 1990 when uh, I was up in Kennebunkport covering the summer vacation. I was on summer vacation duty for for a Newsday covering President Bush. Not, by the way, the worst assignment I've ever had in journalism. I was going to say that wasn't exactly a short stroll. Yeah, that's true. Well, there was a, those Obama's <laughs> vacations in Hawaii yeah, too. So true. there are yeah. you know, there are perks to the job. And, and then there was Waco with George W. Bush. But we'll leave that to <laughs> the conversation. Not that. That's the other side yeah. of the. Yeah, but the at point. this, you know, the Bushes at the end of the summer would give a picnic for the press, uh, the reporters who were covering them, which was very gracious of them. So I go to this picnic with my husband, Carl Loopsdorf, with the Dallas morning news and our two little boys and Barbara Bush comes up to me at this picnic and gives me a hard time about working uh, outside the home when I have two little boys <laughs> and when she first came up and kind of upbraided me on this I thought she was teasing and so I made some teasing response and then it was clear she was not teasing it was that she thought I should have to defend my life choices and the decision to uh to work when my kids were were young. And meanwhile, of course, my Ben and Will are acting like they have been raised by wolves, <laughs> not really helping my argument that no, it's no. really okay for me to work outside the home. So the, so she was, the, these were both examples of her being pretty fierce and being mm -hmm. no pushover and being something other than just the warm grandmother that a lot of voters thought they saw. Uh, the first time I met Mario Cuomo way back when, I thought he was kidding too. Um, little did I know that was what he was and what everybody learned afterwards the way he was. So you had this kind of hard, hard beginning with her, and then you end up the person reading her diaries at the end. So how's the, when you approached her with this book idea... Uh, did you like come in disguise or did you sort of say, yeah, I'm that same Susan Page member when? No, not, not at all. And I think that's part of her, um, part of what's admirable about her. She knew, she knew that I was a reporter. And when I, I actually signed the contract to write the biography of her without ever checking with her about whether she'd cooperate. And possibly that was stupid, but here was my reasoning. Uh, my reasoning was, if she said no, I'd be very discouraged. Would I still have the guts to go through with it? But I also thought if she said yes, at the point I was still just considering whether to do it, that she would think she had some sway over what I wrote. And I didn't want to do an authorized biography. I wanted to do a work of journalism. And so I signed a contract to write the book, and then I wrote her a letter saying, I am writing a biography of you, and I hope you'll talk to me. And she agreed to talk to me once. And at the end of the interview, I asked if I could talk to her a second time. And she said yes. And we never had a longer term agreement than that. At the end of each interview, I would ask if I could come back again. And she always said yes. And at the end of the fifth interview, she did something that I never expected her to do, which was to give me permission to read her diary. Had you asked? Uh, well, in the first interview, she said, don't even ask me about my diaries. You can't see them. <laughs> uh, but I had asked uh, in the third interview if I could read her diary entries that related to Reza Gorbachev because I was very interested in her in her camp private campaign to win over Reza Gorbachev in an effort to help the negotiations that brought the Cold War to a, to a peaceful conclusion. And I also thought that it was one part of her diary she might be willing to show to me because they weren't about her family members or something more personal. And so at the end of the fifth interview, I said, have you thought about whether I could see your diary entries, entries about Reza Gorbachev? And that's when she said, I've thought about it, 
you can see them. You can see them all. Wow. So then I did exactly the wrong thing, by the way, which was... You fell off your chair. <laughs> I said, I said, are you sure? <laughs> um, yes, the perfect journalist question. I Journalistic was, question. I was just so uh, stunned. Uh, but fortunately, she seemed to be sure. And so I was able to see her diaries. They will not be available to the public for many years. Uh, is there anything that's not in the book that was in the diaries that you didn't feel... And obviously, you know, tell us what they are if there is something. But you don't, you didn't feel was um, important or uh, worth putting in now for some reason that we will read about later. So they, they, the diaries are not available under the provisions of her donation of them to the Bush Forty One Library until twenty fifty three. So we've got a long wait before those diaries are going to be open for for public view. Uh, there, there were many things I didn't from the diaries that I didn't include in the book. I mean, think about this. She started keeping a diary in 1948, <laughs> and she kept it off and on until two weeks before she died. The final entry wow. was 12 days before she died. That's a lot of diary. And so there were many things in the diaries that were interesting or provocative that I didn't include. And here was the standard I used for including things. I, I included things that illuminated her. I didn't include things that would be embarrassingly personal about other family members um, or things, th things that were deeply personal that didn't illuminate who she was for the audience I was writing for. Uh, so that was the standard I tried to apply. And did you feel in reading those, you had spent five long interviews with her, plus you'd covered her for all of these years. Did you gain... Um, some insight into her that you didn't really have any idea there that was there? Was there something that, in reading the diaries like, wow, I had no idea? So two, two things were, I think, quite uh, amazing from the diaries. One is just the fact that the number of times and circumstances in which she would talk about Robin, uh, Robin who was you know three years old when she died and who had died decades earlier, uh, but she would remember this is Robin's birthday, or this is the date that Robin died, or I, uh, I wonder when I see Robin in heaven, will she look like she did at three, or will she have grown up like the rest of us, grown older? Um, there were just, when she, when she contemplated the issue of abortion, she wrote about her feelings about Robin's birth and death. So that was one of the threads that just was so striking in the diaries that I had not understood before. The other thing less poignant was how much she and Nancy Reagan hated each other. <laughs> oh, do tell. You know, she, do tell. She had, uh, you know, they we we knew we knew they weren't great friends uh, at the time. I don't think we understood that they were really mortal enemies on both sides. Uh, just a lot of toxic feelings there, and from from Barbara Bush's point of view, Nancy Reagan was just a mean girl to her. From day one, what was the start of all of that? I think this. I think one start of it was that George Bush and Ronald Reagan ran against each other in the 1980 Republican primaries, and it wasn't a particularly brutal primary. But you know, campaigns do have you are running against somebody, um, so I think there was some. I think Nancy Reagan harbored some resentments for how George Bush attacked Ronald Reagan in 1980. Although, of course, then he became an extremely loyal vice president. To Reagan, so that was that was maybe the impetus of it. But they were also just for women who seemed so much alike. They were so different. You know, they were born a few years apart. They both went to Smith. They both married men they adored. Uh, they both became important partners to their husbands as their husbands became uh, powerful and ultimately won the presidency. But they were so at odds in terms of their personal priorities. Uh, and their attitudes about what was important and what was not. And uh, Nancy Reagan looked at Barbara Bush and saw someone who didn't seem to care about how she looked, didn't dye her hair, often didn't dress that well, seemed to be kind of frumpy. Um, oh, but they always had, had pearls. Always had. I mean, I, I, think, I think that does, you know, dress up anything. Well, and, but, and fake pearls. And she would brag about them being fake pearls. That's not something that Nancy <laughs> Reagan would have done. But Na Barbara Bush, I think, then looked at Nancy Reagan and saw a mother who had a dysfunctional relationship with her children. And that was something that I think Barbara Bush had
had a very hard time understanding. Well, the current president's uh, reaction to your book uh, suggested that uh, Barbara Bush does hold or did hold grudges. <laughs> um, uh, I think he pointed to the 2016 campaign when um, he had quite a disparaging nickname for uh, her son, Jeb. I think it was Low Energy Jeb uh, in that campaign. And obviously he went on to um, to beat him and get the, the Republican nomination and, and the White House. Um, was that the, the whole story behind what is seen as the Barbara Bush, Donald Trump feud? <laughs> you know, Bar Barbara Bush kept grudges. She kept score. Uh, she would remind her, her husband, you know, George Bush tended to forgive transgressions. Uh, Barbara Bush often did not. It would remind him about what so-and-so wasn't for you then, uh, for instance. Um, you know, with, with, uh, with Donald Trump... Barbara Bush's antipathy for him went back a long way. I found a diary entry from 1990, uh, before uh, Trump was in politics, oh. um, where Barbara Bush is following news of his divorce from Ivana and calls him a symbol of the greed of the 1980s. And one thing I think we didn't fully understand, or at least I didn't at the time, was that in 1988... Donald Trump went to Lee Atwater, who, as you know, was Bush's top political strategist, mm -hmm. um, and suggested he would be available to be his running mate oh. in 1988, wow. which the Bushes did not, which President Bush did not think was a thing he wanted to do. And then, of course, you had Trump successfully running against Jeb Bush and also taking the Republican Party in a direction that Barbara Bush found alarming. Uh, you know, in fact, she told me um, in the last interview I had with her that she no longer considered herself a Republican in a, in a Republican Party that was led by Donald Trump. That's, that's huge in and of itself. You know, I went, in reading through the book and some, watching some of your national interviews on your coast-to-coast -coast book tour, which I wanted to comment at some point, um, I was struck by... I don't know, and I get your reaction on this. Barbara Bush seemed to me to be either ahead of her time or sometimes behind her times, but I never thought she was quite of the moment. So her her, her, her position on AIDS and HIV was seemed so advanced. Her protest over um, speaking at Wellesley because she really quite wasn't with the women's feminist thing, wasn't quite up to speed. On the other hand, her, her position on abortion seemed both ahead and behind. I don't know. It was. Just, did you have a sense that this she never quite felt right in the moment, but was sort of on both sides of the chronology? I don't know. It's just a reaction I had. You know, I think that's a really um, smart observation, but I think it meant I, because I think she was at odds often with whatever the kind of cultural moment was, but she was not uncomfortable with that. She was. I think it kind of reflected her independent spirit, right? Her willingness, for instance, to uh, think that the country was on the wrong course when it came to attitudes toward AIDS and do, trying to do something about it. Or her view that feminism and the women's movement uh, was doing damage in some ways, in ways she didn't like. So she was, she was all, she, I think she always felt free to say what she thought and what she thought was sometimes at odds with where the country was generally at that moment. Yeah, and, and I was struck also, you know, the pollster in me, uh, her favorability ratings nationally and the Gallup numbers were off the charts compared to other um, other first ladies. And, and I must say I was surprised by that, having been of the age to have lived passed through all that time. I, I, I am surprised that her numbers were so strong relative to others, but... Uh, I guess uh, that that didn't surprise you, or was part part and parcel. You know who it surprised? It surprised her. <laughs> she was surprised by how popular she was, and um, she would. She said that the reason that she and Reza Gorbachev, among others, asked her why she was so popular and how they could maybe replicate her popularity with her own uh, with her own population. Barbara Bush said that she thought she was. But she had a very self-deprecating manner, and she approached her popularity in that way. And she said, you know, I'm overweight and gray-haired, and I don't threaten anybody, 
and that's why people like me. Now, I don't think that's entirely why people liked her, but she was authentic and approachable and compassionate, and I think people recognize that in her. Before we let you go, one last question, probably a short answer, but that's up to you. Do you think she's remembered or will be remembered by history as a first lady or as the title of the book, the matriarch of um, one of the great political dynasties in American history? So tell me if there's a third Bush who becomes president. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, well, uh, I can't look into the future, but let's say there isn't. Do you think that she's remembered more for her role? Because she was only first lady for four years, but she seems to have a much, much bigger place in history than a four-year first lady. And, you know, she's she's remembered as first lady. She's remembered as first mother of George W. Bush and of this this uh, Bush dynasty. She's I think she's also remembered as a figure in her own right. Um, and, you know, this was one of the things that I think I didn't know when I was working on the book whether anyone would actually be interested in a book about a first lady who had had one term in the White House, only four years, and had been left the White House a quarter century earlier, did people still care? And I think what we found was that people were still interested. We, and we saw that also uh, when she passed away in April of last year, just over a year ago. The outpouring of affection for her, I think, reflected that people saw something in her that they thought was worth celebrating. So you came, you came off one book, one book tour, one down, but there's another one coming? I am busily at work at a biography of yet another formidable woman, Nancy Pelosi. Oh, that should have no contemporary interest at all, right? <laughs> <laughs> Susan, thanks so much for uh, joining uh, with us today and uh, all your insights and, and, and everything you shared along the way, and it's a great book. It was my pleasure, thank you so much. That will do it for this edition of Poll Hub. Poll Hub is a production of the Marist Poll at Marist College in Poughkeepsie, New York. Thank you to Mary Griffith, our executive producer, as always, doing a wonderful job. And we'd also like to take the opportunity to thank the Roper Center Archives at Cornell University, who provide us with the ability to look back in time at trend data, at survey questions, the results. It helps enlighten what we're talking about, particularly when we have to look back at things over the past decades. And we love to hear from you. Questions about poll, questions about polls in general, maybe questions you'd like us to ask on polls. And the best way to contact us is through social media. We're at Marist Poll Facebook, and we're in Instagram, and we're in Twitter, and, you know, all those various places. So reach out to us that way. And don't forget to look down at the device on which you are listening to this podcast on and hit subscribe. We'll see you next time.